which is how strong is the gun evidence? I just read it to you. We need to decipher it, figure out what it means, and put some context and perspective on it to really evaluate how strong it is. With us, to break it all down, firearms expert, studio armorer for more than 30 years, and author of the guidebook, Prop Gun Safety for Film and TV, Dutch Merrick is with us, and criminal defense attorney, host of the Defense Diaries podcast, Bob Mata, who's inside that courtroom for this trial. Dutch, I want to begin with you. Um, I just read a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo uh, about all of this. It's the expertise. You're an expert. Walk us through this so we understand this process and how these markings can end up on a cartridge, an unspent cartridge versus a fired cartridge, and, and kind of explain it to us. So it's important to uh, get back to the basics of how a bullet works. A cartridge, which is all four elements of uh, a, a round, is the bullet, which is the projectile, a primer, which lights off the gunpowder, and it's all held together by the case. And the case in this instance is made of brass. So that entire assemblage goes into the chamber. The chamber holds it snug, and when you fire it, the bullet goes out the barrel. Um, that chamber potentially could leave marks on the case. Uh, the chamber is designed to let the bullet come in and out smoothly, uh, but when you fire it, that case does expand a little bit, and then there's an extractor, which is like a little claw that grabs the case at the base and pulls it out of the chamber, because it might be in there snugly, and then the ejector is a rod that flips it out of the extractor and tosses it away. So the process of the bullet going in the chamber, the extractor grabs it, and the ejector pushes it further out of the way. But each of those two things, the ex extractor and the ejector, <laughs> can leave a mark. Those are generally made of steel and the brass case is, is softer metal and it will, it will be marked as it's functioning in the gun. Okay, um, can you demonstrate any of this for us? Just give us a better idea of how all this is working? Yeah, so I'll switch to my overhead camera here. I have a box of studio dummies that we use for the movies. These are dummy cartridges and they each have a rattle in them and I'll rattle it for the microphone. You might be able to hear that. So I've tested each of these. These, is, these are dummy rounds. I'm going to chamber one into this. This is a, not the same pistol. I didn't have access to a P226 uh, this quickly. So this H and K USP will function very similarly. I'll take the magazine, put it in the grip, and when I chamber around, you can see it go from the magazine into the chamber. And then when it ejects, it pulls it out of the case and, and shoots it out. So inside the gun, you'll see this is the extractor rod that pulls out the case. And then the ejector rod is the one that pushes it off of the extractor. And it's important to note the base of the cartridge has a little notch here so that it can be grabbed by the extractor. So when you put it Hopefully in, let, let me ask you a question really quickly. So when you placed it in there and then it popped out, that's that's... Is that considered cycling through the gun and, and it's and it's and, and it's an unspent cartridge at that point? That's correct. So you can take a, a full live cartridge, feed it into the chamber from the magazine, and that has been cycled into the breech, and you can manually eject it by pulling the action open and that clears the breech or you can fire the gun, which is the energy of the cartridge itself that pushes the bullet forward and puts uh, pressure on the case backwards, and it will cycle the round from the energy of a cartridge firing. So there's two ways to do it, manually when you're loading and unloading, load, unloading with your hands, or the bullet itself firing, hence the term semi-automatic firearm. When you pull the trigger, it fires, and it rechambers the next round. All right, one more follow-up, then I want to get to Bob to get the legal aspect of all of this. So what they compared apparently inside the courtroom was a fired uh, cartridge and, and, and then an unspent one. And she said she saw similar markings between one that was fired and one that just went in and then popped out like, like you demonstrated to us. Do they, w would they have the same markings? Would there be any markings that would be similar if they went through seemingly two different processes? Well, when a gun is fired, there's a lot of pressure and energy, and that case is being beaten back and shot out re with very aggressively. When you're chambering a gun just with your hands, uh, it's less energy and it's more passive. However, in both instances, they will leave some marks on the brass. 
I think my opinion is that when you're firing, it leaves more aggressive marks on the brass, uh, more easily discernible. But when you're simply chambering around and that cartridge case is riding up into the extractor uh, little tang, it is leaving a mark nonetheless. Okay, and, and, and one more small follow-up to that. Would those marks be sure. similar but just different levels of depth because of the, 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 because of the pressure, right? Like one mark would be deeper and perhaps easier to see, and the other one would be a little bit lighter, but the patterns, would you expect to be similar? Yes, the extractor rod, it, due to manufacturing imperfections, those each uh, can be individually identified per gun. So an extractor rod in this particular P226 will leave this mark, and another gun that has different wear in it and different manufacturing imperfections will leave a unique uh, mark on that. And again, when you're firing it, it does treat the case more aggressively, and it should leave deeper marks or more readable marks. Um, but even when you're chambering it by hand, it leaves a mark, albeit likely uh, less depth or a little softer marks. Dutch makes it make sense to me. Bob Model, let me ask you the ultimate question, though. How strong is this gun evidence? We're used to ballistic evidence in, in murder cases. Well, I'm thrilled that Dutch is on here because I've been dying to talk to another gun expert. So I sat in there and I'm going to add a little X factor for you, Dutch, and I hope that you can answer the question. So when Melissa Oberg, the firearms uh, examiner, did her testing, okay, she took 10 rounds that she used that they had in, in the lab there. She grabbed them out. She first tried to cycle four, which you showed us for all of us to see what a cycling is, where she just racked the gun and ejected four of them. Those, none of those four rounds that she did that to left significant enough marks for her to make an examination of any of those rounds. That's when she decided to resort to firing the next six rounds. And it was one of those that she decided to make the comparison to. And that's where she found that there was a sufficient agreement. So, I mean, in my world, if the story has been, we have three ejector marks on this particular round, which means that we, we know it's the bullet's still in there, the projectile is still in there. So that tells us that that particular round had been cycled through, as you showed us here on live TV, uh, or, you know, <laughs> that uh, they pop it out like that. And, and we have a situation where we, she did the very testing that they're alleging must have happened because it's still an unspent casing at the time that they find it. So obviously it was never shot. How is that, how am I supposed to, to make those two things make sense in terms of we've yeah. got her doing the same action, but yet it didn't leave significant enough markings for her to make a comparison. And she has to resort to firing it in order to get a mark that she could try to make a comparison with. Yeah, how about that Dutch? So. Yeah, absolutely. And I had the same question when I heard the testimony that there were three cases that she manually fed that didn't leave a mark. Um, and so discussions that I've had with other professionals, it seems in shooting situations like that, well, first of all, how did the, the unfired round end up near the bodies in the, or near the crime scene? Um, and any manner of thing could have happened. He could have cycled an extra round at the beginning to chamber it. He could have had a jam or didn't feed and then he aggressively cycled it. And I think the thing is, is if you're in a panic and you're in a, in a very uh, uh, stress-induced moment, you might cycle that gun very hard to get it clear. You might do it very aggressively. And if this investigator did a gentle cycling, it's far less likely to leave a mark. So that's the that's the that's how I'm making a mental connection in the gap there between the unmarked cases that she tried in, in controlled circumstances and what happened at the crime scene. Dutch Merrick, nobody does it better. Thank you so much. When we come back, what was revealed in the recorded calls?